Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center. Come out wherever you are with Lee Vinden. Well, we're just so happy that each one of you could join with us this afternoon for this, the final of the series, The Revelation of Whom, with Pastor Lee Vinden. By this time, you certainly know that Pastor Vinden is the full-time revivalist uh, for the um, conference, Upper Columbia Conference. I had to stop and think for a moment the name of the conference. And uh, he's the full-time revivalist there. Also, that he has been a pastor for 30 years. Uh, he is married to his wife, Margie, and uh, they have two uh, adult children. So we're just happy that Pastor Vinda could be with us. It's been such a blessing. Today's subject, come out wherever you are. We're looking forward to that. This morning we were blessed so much with Mara Mara on the wall. And uh, we're looking forward. By the way, if some of you are, who are watching live did not uh, get that, it'll be at 7 o'clock Central Time, re-shown uh, the message that was shown here live at 11. So uh, that's if you're watching live. We're so happy that we could all be together, that we can enjoy this series and be blessed by it. Before Pastor Vinden comes, Danny Shelton is going to join us at this time, and he's going to sing, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. of the Lord is in this place I can feel his mighty power and his grace I can hear the brush of angels wings I see glory on each face surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. In the midst of his children, the Lord said he would be. It doesn't take very many. It can be just Two or three, and then I feel that same sweet spirit that I've felt oft times before. Surely I can say I've been with my Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place I can feel his mighty power and his grace I can hear the brush of angels wings I see glory on each face surely you feel the presence of the Lord for he's in this place there's a holy hush around us as God's glory fills this place I've touched the hem of his garment I can almost see his face and my heart is overflowing with the fullness of his joy for I know without a doubt that I've been with the Lord sing it with me if you know it surely the presence of the Lord is in this place 
I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Oh, surely the presence of our Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Isn't it wonderful <clears throat> that he, you know, God Emmanuel with us, isn't it wonderful that he can be in this place and uh, not just in this place, but in this place? Amen. Let's have one more prayer. So Lord Jesus, I just echo as a prayer the words of that song. Um, thank you into my heart into my heart come into my heart lord jesus come into this place come into each of our hearts and as we look together in your direction i pray that you'll stir us deeply may we be touched not just in our minds but also in our hearts we need the holy spirit for that so i'm asking for spiritual eyeglasses and hearing aids to be handed out to every person and i'm asking for that same spirit to crowd whatever needs to be crowded out of me so that i can be a useful tool I just want to be a tool, and I'm asking for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to begin by showing you a beautiful collection of flowers. Just check these things out. Don't those look nice? Look at the colors, the delicate petals. The, just the, aren't they beautiful? I have one more slide of a, of a bunch of those same flowers. Aren't they good? Wouldn't you love to maybe have a whole bouquet of those flowers or maybe have an arrangement made and have them sent to a friend of yours with those beautiful flowers? Oh, not so fast. I want to tell you, these flowers are first cousins to one more flower, and here it comes next. They are all. These flowers are carnivorous. <laughs> they are Venus flytraps. There's one closing in right there. Here comes another picture sequence. We're going to show you another one. There's open, kind of luring that insect in. Then it comes down. Here comes the next one and one more. And that insect is history. That's it. See, these plants, they look gorgeous on the surface, but they are able to eat insects, small rodents, and small children. They are carnivorous. <clears throat> they look like something they aren't. They look better, but death lurks within. We're going to look at a fourth angel. And this fourth angel, you'll hear more about in a minute, but uh, the 17th chapter of Revelation begins with an angel showing John a prostitute riding on a seven-headed monster. She is dressed in purple, and scarlet and glittering with jewels and she sits on many waters John's instructed a little bit more about that later on but we're just told at the beginning she sits on many waters now her external beauty is enough to capture the attention of the entire world external beauty like those flowers she looks so good the entire world is mesmerized by her they are enchanted by her. She is so attractive. Something that seems irresistible about her. Though she looks attractive, this golden cup that she holds is filled with abom abominable filth. Try to say that seven times fast. Abominable filth. She's known by many names, 
But the one that is most familiar to us and we have referred to already in our series is Babylon. Babylon. Now, I want you to remember that Babylon symbolizes pride and self-dependence. It is a symbol of living life apart from Jesus, living life apart from God. Now, she is in league with rulers and nations to destroy God's faithful people. This is all there in chapter 17. She inspires rulers and nations to attack the lamb, but we have good news early on in the chapter, Revelation 17, 14, the lamb, even though they attack, the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called and chosen and faithful followers. Okay, then chapter 17 ends with an angel explaining that the many waters represent the people of the earth. People of the earth. Chapter 18 begins with another angel whose blazing glory lights up the whole earth. So think about a comet or something approaching the planet and it's just blazing with glory and a tail of glory streaming back from it as it's racing towards our planet. It's not a comet, it's another angel. And this angel is crying with a loud voice and so this angel is like shouting. There must be a sense of urgency in this angel. He is desperate that people on the planet hear what he has to say. He shouts with a loud voice that Babylon has crumbled to ruins and become home to everything evil, detestable, wicked, and unclean. And then in verse 3 of chapter 18, this angel observes that all nations, excuse me, not all nations, that all have fallen for her seductions. All. Uh, it's important I make that distinction. I, I, it was a Freudian slip to throw the word nations in because it says all have fallen for her seductions and tasted her wine. Presidents, kings, businessmen, great and small, everyone has traded with her. Everyone is treated with her. Now, regardless of what you think about prostitution, based on this chapter, all sucker for what she represents. Regardless of what you think of prostitution, all sucker for what she represents. What she offers then must be extremely attractive or all wouldn't sucker for it. What is it? What is it that crosses every geographical boundary? Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter. What is it that crosses every socioeconomic group? What is it that permeates every country, every age, both genders, all? What is it? What is the sin that doth so easily beset? What is it? Hebrews 12.1, Paul says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I'm going to tell you what it is. The sin that so easily besets that everyone is guilty of on the planet is self-dependence. Doing it myself. Doing it my way living my life, good or bad, apart from Jesus. Self-dependence and pride are the com commodities that this harlot trades in. I think self-dependence and pride are Siamese twins. They go together. They go together. Siamese twins. This problem of self-dependence and pride is so extensive in the world and in us that only God can fix it. We can't. It is too deep-rooted. We cannot fix it. And so in verse 4 of chapter 18, God calls us to come to Him. He calls us, yes, us, to come to Him 
for help. Revelation 18, 4. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven, come out from her. Please note the, the last two words. My people. My people. It is possible to be among his people and still be struggling with pride and self-sufficiency. Huh. Sometimes I'll preach a sermon somewhere and as I'm out greeting people afterwards, they'll come up and tell me that was just awesome. That was tremendous. And I think about what HMS Richards used to say to those kinds of comments. Yeah, he said, the devil was telling me that before I was half finished. He wanted me to think, oh, you're doing a great job. You're, Richards, you are on top of your game. Man, they are going to wow about this sermon. One person who in one of my congregations realized and knew that I um, didn't like that kind of stuff because of what it does to me came out one time and he shook my hand and he said to me, Pastor Venden, that was a masterful sermon. And he said, and do you know what I mean? And he pointed like that. And I said, thank you for reminding me it was full. If it was full of the master, then it couldn't be me. It would have to have been him. But it is easy. It is easy. Oh, pride and self-sufficiency, the sin that does so easily beset. I was asked to do an early morning camp meeting presentation with another fella, a good friend of mine. He'd been my associate pastor, and he later followed me in that church as the senior pastor. And his name is Bill Roberts. And uh, they'd asked the two of us to each do half of the morning meetings, the early morning meetings for camp meeting. Well, he was supposed to do the first half, and I was supposed to do the second half. And I, can't, and I love Bill Roberts. And I came to the first meeting that he did, and I sat in the back, and I had this thought go through my head. I wonder how many people will be here for Bill compared to how many will be here for me. And I hated it. I just, as soon as that thought went through my head, I said, Lord Jesus, SOS, I don't want to think that way. But there it went. It, that thought went through my mind. The next morning meeting, I sat on the front row so that I couldn't see the number of people that were there for Bill because I didn't want that anymore. But as the week progressed, I kept thinking, into my head it would come again. I wonder how the audience size will compare between him and me. And finally, it was my turn to, to speak when the week was half over. And I was sitting on the front row waiting for a pulpit. And in my head, the devil was going, turn around and look. This place is fuller than it was with Bill. And I said, SOS, Lord Jesus, I don't want this sin that so easily besets pride and self-sufficiency. Will you save me from myself? And all of a sudden, as I'm there praying, someone taps my knee. I look over, it's Bill Roberts. And he says, Lee, could I just pray for you before you go on? Can we just slip over to the side for a minute? I just want to pray for you. And I said, yes. And we went over to the side. And Bill started praying for me. A prayer that was so self-effacing. Lord Jesus, I want you to use my friend Lee today. I want Jesus to be lifted up. And he just prayed this beautiful prayer for me. And as he prayed, I wept. And as he prayed, I felt the Holy Spirit flush the toilet of my heart. <laughs> free of all of that stuff. I couldn't get rid of it. But as Bill prayed, the Holy Spirit did it for me. And when he finished, I said, Bill, I'll tell you later why that prayer meant so much to me, but you will never know at the moment how important it was. It is the... I was talking to James Rafferty at Arizona Camp Meeting. We were there together. And I told him, man, Man, I just don't want people to tell me they liked it. <laughs> I just can't seem to handle it. He said, yeah, he said, it's the 
final frontier. It's the one that's just hanging out there for us, hanging out there. <clears throat> it is possible to be among God's people and to still be struggling with pride and self-sufficiency. You see, you would have to be in her before he could call you out from her. Right? Right? have to be in her before you could be called out from her. God's people have been in Babylon far more frequently and for far longer than the, children, than the Jews were held captive. God's people have been in Babylon for 6,000 years. God's people. God's people. <clears throat> In 1 Kings 2, verse 2, King David says, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Now, he was talking to Solomon, and I'm sure that he was talking about the fact that he was going to be dying soon. He was getting on in years. He didn't know how many he had left, and he was telling him, it's not long from now, I'm probably going to be dying. But as I read that verse, I thought, yeah, David, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Other translations say I'm about to go the way of all men. All men. You know what the way of all men is? It is not death. It is pride and self-sufficiency. That is the way of all men. And it happens even to God's people. David starts out humbly, dependent upon God. You go up against Goliath with a few smooth stones. And you don't, you know, you know that you are outclassed. Humanly speaking, you know you're outclassed. You don't even come up to the guy's navel, you know. But David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And God powers that slingshot and directs that stone. And the giant falls. And David knows who's responsible. And David serves God with a pure heart. But King Saul's impressed. And he says, David, I want to make you head of my army. Go out there and win some more for us. So David goes out. And as he comes back, he is victorious. Well, you know what? I used to think he was a mighty general. But actually, it doesn't take rocket science to know that if you go to God first and say, shall we go up against this host? And God says, yes, go up against this host and I will give them into your hand. Then you're going to win. Amen. So David wasn't like such a wonderful general as he was such a quick guy to run to the Lord and get his marching orders before he went to battle. And God said, okay, go up against this one. I'll give them to you. And David goes. And he comes back. And the people say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Oh, David, you do good work. And David kept hearing that. And he began to become independent and self-sufficient. And he began asking God fewer and fewer times before going. And he began taking more and more of the credit until one day in his distance from God, he sees Bathsheba and you know the rest. He takes a horrible fall. But horrible falls don't happen overnight. What was going on was David had been neglecting his walk with God and as time passed, he became more and more susceptible to the devil David was a man of God. David was a man of God. His son Solomon, David calls him to him and he says, you know, I'm going to go the way of all men. He says, um, I've gathered all this stuff together to build a temple and I want you to do it. And then he says to him, remember now, remember to seek the God of your father. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. And Solomon starts out great. God comes to him in a dream. This is, these are people who have communion, communion with God. You know, he, God comes to him in a dream. He says, okay, so you're about to take the throne. What would you like from me? You know the story. 
Solomon says, I'm, I'm like a baby. I don't even know how to come or go. I mean, I, I, I am so inadequate and insufficient. I just need wisdom from above. I need strength from above. I need guidance from above. I am a nobody. And God says, I am so glad that you see that. And with that in mind, here's what I'm going to do for you. And Solomon becomes known for being... And he builds a temple for God's glory. But what, do, what does he let them call it? It's called... Solomon's temple Solomon's temple one of the wonders of the ancient world Sol something happened and Solomon began to drift from dependence upon God to dependence upon himself until he let them call God's temple Solomon's temple and we know the fall he made for being the wisest man who ever lived he did a lot of stupid things he really did Moses, Moses meets with God, talks with God, spends days talking with God, weeks talking with God, audible voice, comes back from time with God, his face is shining, it's radiating. People say, put you put on a veil, we can't even handle looking at you, man. You are too, you just, you're overwhelming us. This is what happens, he's so close to God that he radiates the glory of God. Forty years with a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. He's seen miracle after miracle after miracle and finally at the end of this 40 years when it looks like the children of Israel are going to murmur and complain and get turned around again, he strikes the rock and says, must we bring forth water from this rock for you rebels? Must we? He knew good and well that he was no part of it. He could hit that rock till the cows come home and there's not going to be any water coming out of it. But he said, must we? He took the glory. He took the credit. That doesn't happen by accident. You read the story, you find out that Moses had been weary with labor for God and in his work schedule, he had worn thin. And his daily devotional life had worn thin. It is possible to be a worker for God and find yourself so immersed in trying to do his work that you find less and less time to spend for him and with him. And that's what happened with Moses. And in that vulnerable stage, he falls. He takes glory that he knows good and well is not his. And you know the rest of that story. Abraham... He's given dreams. God talks to him. Jesus comes and meets him. They walk face to face. He is called by God, my friend, my friend Abraham. I'm calling these people men of God. These are God's people. And he gets down there in Egypt and he says, Oh man, Sarah is so good looking. They're going to kill me to get her. So he lies. To save himself. Now, who's he depending on? Himself. Then a little later, he and Sarah figuring out on the promise, you know, what we were promised we're going to have all these children. We don't have any yet. And maybe it is that God helps those who help themselves. Maybe we need to do our part. We expect him to do his part. So you father a child with Hagar. God will be so thankful. We finally got a kid going. That he'll bless that kid and then he'll take off from there. And so they depend upon themselves. They take things into their own hands. And we still have trouble in the Middle East and around the world with terrorism today as a result of what happened when Abraham tried to do it himself. Do it himself. This is a man who walked and talked with the Lord Jesus Christ in person. Jacob, he's given dreams. He sees a ladder from earth to heaven. He sees angels coming up and down. He talks with God. God protects him. Oh, there's angel bands commissioned to watch over him. He, 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 he has family worship. He builds altars to God everywhere he goes. And yet, he tried to get the birthright by deception. He tried to help God out. He comes back 
with his family, his brothers coming for him. He's doing everything he can on his own to save his skin. Finally, he comes to the point where he divides his group. I mean, this is a guy who is working as best he can to save himself. And yet he's a man that God's spoken with and given dreams to. He spends 20 years trying to learn the lesson of absolute surrender, which he finally learned at Jabbok. But up until then, God's man struggling with self-dependence. Joshua goes to Jericho. He follows God's instruction. He meets with Jesus in person. The captain of the Lord of hosts gives him the battle plan and says, this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to take care of it. And you're going to see a great victory. And Joshua goes forth in the strength of that promise and under those guidelines and under that battle plan. And Jericho ha just happens to Jericho just like Jesus told him it would. And Joshua comes from Jericho and he says to his men, we did good. Man, we kicked those people so... I mean, tell you what. AI, just a little place over here. Don't. We just go over there. Let's take a small group. Go over and clean them up too. Let's just go mop the floor with them. You saw what we just did to Jericho. We can do that. We don't even need to take the army out. Let's just take a handful. Let's just go over there. And you know what happened. 3,000 men or whatever died because Joshua, a man of God who has just met with Jesus, who... I'm calling that God's people. Someone who's talking to Jesus, person to person, that's God's people. And God's people goes to Ai depending on himself. Just a few days later, depending on himself. Slips into self-dependence. Elijah is up on Mount Carmel. Have mercy. This is a guy on Mount Carmel. He's the Lone Ranger. He prays for fire to come out of the sky. It does. It consumes the altar. It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes the water around the altar. Then he, under God's direction, he asks for the false prophets to be killed. They are. Then he calls for rain, and it comes in such torrents that they can't even see the road, and the king's horses can't find their way. So then under God's power and under God's direction, Elijah runs in front of the horses for 18 miles through the rain, the torrential rain, guides them all the way back to the palace. This is, I would call that a high day, you know? That's a pretty high day. And he's sitting outside the palace with his back against the wall, and Jezebel says, you tell that guy I'm going to have his head by this time tomorrow. And someone comes out and tells him, Jezebel says, she's going to kill you by tomorrow. And just like that, this man of God who has had heaven at his beck and call, if you will, runs, takes off running from the head of women's ministries. <laughs> Bam! He goes racing across the desert to save himself. You see it again. Save himself. Hezekiah, he's dying prophet comes to him and says, God says that, you know, he's heard you pray and he's going to heal you, but you know, if you don't want, if you want to make sure, you know, if you want to see a little promise that he's going to come through, he's even willing to give you a sign. So what would you like? It can have the sundial go forwards, you know, 10 degrees, or it can go backwards, you know, 10 degrees. And, and um, Hezekiah says, cool, man. Well, and so he asks for the sundial to be moved and God moves the earth. <laughs> Moves the earth so that Hezekiah can have a little sample that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. He moves the earth and uh, scientists in Babylon see the earth going, whoa, and they say, what's going on here? And then someone says, we've heard that there's a king in, over in you know, Hezekiah. God did something for him. And they, they go, really? That must be some God. Let's go meet him and find out about his God. They come to meet him and find out about his God. And what does he say? Whoa, guys, let me show you some of my treasure. Okay, I have over here, I got this. And over in this room, I got this. And guess what? I own all of that right over there. And right now, I'm trying to acquire this piece of property. And I think I'm probably going to get it. And you know how much it's worth, by the way? Did I tell you how much that's worth? And, and this and that and the other thing. He shows them all of his treasure. I am somebody. Doesn't even tell them about God. Doesn't even tell. This is a man of God. A man of God. Peter walks on water. 
turns around, looks at the rest of the disciples in the boat. Check it out. Wimps. <laughs> Cowards. Vroom. He's taking some pride. He's starting to feel for just a moment that he somehow was in charge of all that. It was him that was doing it, not... By the way, where's Elijah and Moses right now? Isn't that encouraging? Amen. Isn't it encouraging to you to realize that you can be God's people and still be struggling with independence and pride, Babylon, and end up in heaven one day because of the mercy and grace of God? Isn't that wonderful how he's patient with us? These folks are the cream of the crop, friends. I'm talking about the cream of the crop. David says, I go the way of all men. The cream of the crop. All men. This is a message that we are slow to learn and quick to forget. But the loud cry message of the fourth angel is not a warning to stay away from some particular denomination with headquarters in Rome. The loud cry message is that Babylon is not next door. Babylon lives in me. It lives in me. And Jesus shouts to us in his book, Babylon is going to fall. Remember the Tower of Babel? It crumbled. And so he says, it's going to fall. My people, my people, in every denomination, my people, even in non-Christian worlds, countries, nations, my people, he says, come out. The tower is about to crumble, and I don't want you destroyed with it when it goes down. That's what he's saying. We can fix this, he's saying. I see the problem. The cream of the crop had the problem. I see it in you, but we can fix this. So come, come, come. Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people. Friends, we have to recognize the personal application of this book or we miss the point. We've missed the point. We don't want to miss the point. I don't want to be destroyed when the tower comes down. Revelation 18, 4 to 5, come out of her, my people. Can you hear him shouting? He's got his hands cupped around his mouth. Do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her. Her sins are piled up as high as heaven and God remembers her evil deeds. Come out of her, my people. The limit has been reached. God is about to destroy her forever. Come out, come out wherever you are. Come out while there's still time. Nine eleven. I'll never forget nine eleven. We were moving the day that nine eleven happened. They were loading our moving van, and everything was packed. And all of a sudden, neighbors came running out and they started shouting at us, "Turn on a TV! Turn on a radio! You aren't gonna believe what's happening!" So we don't have a TV or a radio we can turn on. Everything's packed. Oh, they said, "Well, the twin towers, you know," and they started telling us what's going on. Nine eleven. And then, of course, you remember that there was suddenly shut, they shut down all the airspace over the United States and all planes. That was something. We just lived 18 miles by air, by crow, from SeaTac, Seattle, Tacoma International Airport. And so air traffic, always, always, always. All of a sudden, the sky is empty and quiet for the whole day, 9-11. I, I couldn't watch it because we loaded up, and then we moved. So we're driving all day on 9-11, and I never did. We got to the motel the night, that night as we were en route to where we're going to go, move, and uh, then we turned on the television in the motel. And that, suddenly I see the stuff that most people have been watching all day long, the reruns of the towers coming down and the people running, then the bodies falling as they jump to try and avoid you know, being burned. Horrific. America will never forget 9-11. Are you aware? that there were a number of people who didn't die in 9-11 who should have, who could have. But the reason they didn't was because they had, for one reason or another, not gotten to work that day. One man was late because his son had just started kindergarten, and um, 
he went to take him to the first day and stayed and lingered to make sure everything was okay. Another fellow was alive because it was his turn to bring donuts and he stopped to get the donuts at a bakery and there was a long line. By the time he got done, there was no place to take the donuts. One woman was late because her alarm clock didn't go off that morning and she slept past and had to get to work late. And by the time she got there, work, there was no work. Another one got stuck in the New Jersey Turnpike because of an auto accident that slowed down traffic to a halt and they sat there waiting to get to work, stewing about, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be late. <laughs> I'm glad I was late, I'm glad I was late. Another one missed the bus. And by the time the next one in the route came by, it was too late to get to work because there was no work left. Another one spilled food on her clothing and had to take time to go back in and change and clean up the mess. Another one's car wouldn't start. Another one went back to answer the telephone and ended up having a conversation that delayed them such that they were late. One had a child that dwaddled and wouldn't get ready for school. And by the time they finally got the kid ready for school, it's too late to get to work on time. Another one couldn't get a taxi. Another one's shoes were brand new that day and they were walking to work and they were getting blisters. And so they went to a drugstore to try and find Band-Aids so they could put them on so their feet wouldn't hurt so bad and they couldn't find a drugstore with Band-Aids and so they kept looking until they found one and in the time it took them to find Band-Aids, there was no place to go to work. They didn't perish because they <clears throat> came out of the tower, so to speak. They weren't in it when it collapsed. And the angel with a loud cry is saying, come out. Come out so that you're not in it when it collapses. Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people. In every church, come out of Babylon, my people. Well, the only way you can come out of her, my people, is by coming to Jesus, coming to Jesus. All people have this problem. That's what the scripture said. All people have this problem. The difference between Christians and non-Christians is that Christians do something about it. What they do is they come to Jesus. Just as I am, without one plea, except that your blood was shed for me. Just as I am, I come. O Lamb of God, I come. They come to Jesus to have it removed. When I was having my ordination into the ministry, my father was the, ord that was the one who had been asked to speak for my ordination service. I, I didn't know he was going to be there, and Don Schneider had arranged for it, and it was a wonderful treat and surprise to find my dad showing up at my ordination. I'll never forget what he said to my, me and the other pastor who were being ordained that day. He said, I'm going to tell you a story about Aunt Zelda. So when my, when you're, Lee, when your when you're uncle, when my brother and I were just kids, we used to love to go to Aunt Zelda's house because Aunt Zelda made some of the best homemade bread you could ever want to eat. Oh, my. And she knew whenever we came that we would want to eat it, so she would make it so that it would be timed just as we were getting there. She'd know when we were going to get there, she'd be pulling fresh loaf of bread out of the oven, and we'd smell it as we walk in. And she had her own garden with raspberries and strawberries, and she made her own preserves fresh out of the garden. And she had a cow, and they had their own butter and cream, and she would smear some real butter onto that fresh bread, and she'd put some jam on there. And then he said it would have been terrible if she had just eaten that in front of us. But she didn't do that. No, she gave us slices. That was good, that was better. He said, it'd be even better if she gave us the whole loaf. But he said, there was something that Aunt Zelda could have done that'd be even better than that. She could give us the recipe for the bread so that we don't have to wait to come to Aunt Zelda's in order to have it. And then my dad said, preacher, every time you stand behind a podium, remember to talk about the bread of life and talk about him with such a fresh experience. You've come from the oven. You just pulled this loaf out because you just spent fresh time with him. And you come and you describe what the bread tastes like so beautifully by the grace of God that people start salivating for Jesus. 
And then after they've been attracted to them, don't forget the second part. Here's the second part. Now give the recipe. Give the recipe every time. Never preach about the matchless charms of Jesus without reminding people how they don't have to wait till the next weekend in order to taste the bread and take them through it again, take them through it again. Well, I haven't honored my dad's admonition because we've been kind of going on a subject that includes Jesus, but we haven't given much recipe. We have talked about spending time with Him. We have talked about being in daily fellowship with Him. We have talked about the need for communion and union. We've talked about an intimate personal relationship with Him, but we haven't actually given the handles for it to pick it up and run with. And that's what I do full time. We do a 13-part seminar that's called All About Jesus Revival Seminar, and, and, and we unpack that handles how to carry that relationship into a personal experience that's tangible and real and solid. Uh, but I have 11 minutes till we're going off the air. And so what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to give you a synopsis of a 13-part seminar in less than 11 minutes because I want you to have the recipe as well as the bread. Okay? So we're going to put a little picture up of a three-legged stool. That three-legged stool represents a personal relationship with Jesus. There are three legs on the stool. And each of those legs represents the ingredients or the building blocks for a personal relationship with Jesus. All right? In the seminar, we have a special presentation for each of the legs and some other stuff on top of it. But in a nutshell, the first leg is Bible study. But there's a very important caveat. It is Bible study for the purpose of getting to know Jesus. This is huge. I can't overemphasize how huge this is. He told us, I'm giving you this book. Remember, you search the scriptures because in that you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me, and yet you don't come to me that you find life. See, he's saying, this book is a love letter from my father and myself. This is what we use to commune with you, to fellowship with you, to grow in a personal, intimate walk with you. I didn't give this to you so you could prove that you are on the winning side of the debate. I gave this to you so that you and I could become better friends. So it's Bible study for the purpose of getting to know Jesus better on a daily basis, okay? This is the recipe for bread. This is the recipe. The second leg of the stool is prayer for the purpose of communion with God. This is hugely different from prayer because I'm in trouble and I need help. This is not 911. This is not the emergency number. Jesus is good about being there for help. He's good. He's okay with that. But he wants to do far more for you and me than simply answer our troubled needs. He wants to be our friend. He wants us to experience the joy of friendship with him. He wants us to know him. And so he says, Can we, could we talk? Could we talk? Let's talk. And you begin talking with Jesus as one would talk with a friend. When I talk to my friends, I don't spend the conversation asking for favors. When I talk with my friends, I say, so, you know, what's been going on? What do you have to share? Here's what I have to share. Oh, I love that story. Tell it to me again. And as you use the Word of God while you're in prayer, you'll discover that you'll hear His voice speaking to you through these pages. He says, my sheep know my voice. And, and we've been told that the Bible is as surely the voice of God as if we could hear him with our own ears. That's a direct quote. So there he is. And he's waiting to talk to you and to talk to me. And so prayer becomes an interactive experience with God in his word. That's the second leg of the stool. This is called a relationship with Jesus stool. The fourth leg of the stool is share. As you begin to get more excited about a friendship with Jesus, you have something to share. Now you have something to share. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have anything to share. If you don't know Jesus, all you have to share is information and facts. It's all you have. You have to know Jesus before you can share Jesus. Sharing Jesus is something more than giving out a piece of paper. Sharing Jesus is saying, let me tell you what Jesus means to me. Remember those demoniacs? Jesus cast out the pigs and then the people come and you know that story and 
And then they say, would you leave us because you're hard on the local economy and so Jesus is leaving and the demoniac said, could we go with you? And Jesus says to them, I believe this is, this is witnessing 101 taught by Jesus in the book of Mark. And he says, no, I want you to go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. That is witnessing 101. And you know what? When you tell people what great things the Lord has done for you, nobody argues with you. This is amazing. If you try to prove to someone that you are more correct than they are, they dig in and they come back with their counter arguments. But if you tell someone what Jesus means to you, what he's doing in your life, the transforming power of his grace, how he has given you victory in this or that besetting sin, and you share this fresh experience of release and freedom and joy in Christ, they don't argue. They go, really? Is that real? I mean, you, you can have that kind of walk with God. I, I, I was doing a seminar uh, in Oregon and uh, I said this. I said, you know, when you tell people what Jesus means to you, they don't argue. And there was a young man. Well, I call him young now that I'm almost 60. I call him young. It's amazing how young looks like as you get older. And he was a young fellow. He was probably about 35 or 40. And uh, he had a family sitting there with him. And when I said, when you tell people what Jesus means to you, they don't argue. He said, got that right. 18 years on crack, Jesus set me free. And when I tell people what he's done for me, they don't say, I would disagree with that point. They say to me, how can I know you're Jesus? They are attracted to a person who has power to transform lives. And uh, so the third leg of the stool is you start spilling over about what Jesus means to you. That's the third leg. This isn't rocket science. It's just three things. Bible study, prayer, and share. But you know what? It's the three things that most of us find very difficult to do. It is simple to describe. It is difficult to do. And the reason it's difficult to do it is because every time you get serious about sending quiet time along with God, the devil's going to get serious about giving you some distraction because he knows when you're doing that, you're doing the one thing that's needful. Remember what Jesus said to, Mary, to Martha? He said, what Mary's doing is the one thing that's needful. That's the one thing that's needful. And so when you go after the one thing that's needful, the devil goes after you. And he will use stuff. This is amazing to me. I used to think the devil was all about trying to get us to be evil, wicked, mean, bad, and nasty. Actually, the devil doesn't care whether you're naughty or nice. Doesn't matter to him. He's perfectly happy to have you nice. As long as you are not in friendship, fellowship, relationship with Jesus, you can be as nice as you want because one day you're going to be lost for eternity being nice. You'll be one of the nicest people who are destroyed. Well, isn't he nice? We're not saved for being nice. We're saved for being in relationship with Jesus. John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal. It's who you know. It's who you know. Jesus is saying, you want to go to heaven? I'll tell you how to get eternal life. You got to know the right people. You have to have friends in high places. policeman stopped a woman for speeding and he's looking at her driver's license he said ma'am it says on your license you're supposed to wear glasses too while you drive so we have two infractions you're speeding and you're not wearing your glasses and she said to him I have contacts <laughs> and he said lady I don't care who you know you are supposed to wear glasses <laughs> well he had a different conception of contacts than she had <laughs> you want to go to heaven you're going to have to have contacts Amen. and now I'm not talking about eyewear you have to know Jesus. You have to know his Father. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens by the three-legged stool experience very deliberately and very intentionally on a daily basis. That's how it happens. And we people who work for Jesus, I'm talking now about a preacher here. I'm talking about myself. The devil is going to do everything he can to make that difficult for me to do because he knows if I don't have that going. It's curtains, man. It's curtains. So... He will get me so distracted with trying to work for Jesus, visit for Jesus, call for Jesus, preach for Jesus, study for Jesus, that I don't take time for Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, the three-legged stool. It's not optional. It's the basis of the Christian life. You're never going to know someone you don't spend time with, and knowing Jesus is what eternity is based on. Well, I'm going to end on a little 
trinity of quotations. The first one comes from a book called Faith I Live By. I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel. So now we're talking about this fourth angel that says, come out of her. And to give, unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to that message. So this voice, the shouting angel, is giving power and force to the three angels' message. See, this is, this, I'm here at 3 ABN, 3 Angels Broadcasting Network. And this angel is bringing his voice to add power to the three angels that this broadcasting network is determined to declare before the world. He adds his voice to give power to their message. The work of this angel joins in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. That was the first one. Here's the second one. Testimonies, Volume 6. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way for the Lord. This is the glory of God. This is what's going to close the work of the third angel. The third angel's message gets closed by a focus on the righteousness of Christ and His matchless love. That's what closes the work. And one more letter to Battle Creek. This message is to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. It presents justification through faith. It invites people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience. He crowds out the self in me and creates in me a Christ-like dependence and character. Many have lost sight of Jesus. Oh, dear. How could we let that happen? Many have lost sight of Jesus. They need to have their eyes directed to His divine person, His merits, His changeless love for the human family. All power is given into His hands that He may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of His own righteousness to the helpless human agent. I'm helpless to rid Babylon, rid myself of Babylon, but one of His priceless gifts to the helpless human agent is His own righteousness his own power, his own transforming love. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed from three angels broadcasting network. It is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, and I thank God for the proclamation that goes forth from this place. It is to be attended with an outpouring of his spirit in large measure. Praise you, Jesus. He's going to get it done, and when he gets it done, we're going to go home, and when we go home, we're going to go, I know you and he's going to say I know you too and I came for my friends and I'm so glad you're one of them Lord Jesus I've got 10 seconds to say thank you for being our friend we want to be friends with you from now until you come amen